praying to get a higher mark for question four for OCR GCSE English Language Paper 2, Schofield on Shakespeare. Here's the marking grid that you should know by heart. Up to 12 marks for nuanced weighing up and skillfully embedded, carefully chosen quotations. Up to six marks for comparisons. And a reminder of my top tips. A three sentence introduction is useful in which you summarise each text before making an initial point in relation to the question. Within each main paragraph, start with a topic sentence that focuses sharply on the statement. In the subsequent sentence, incorporate a carefully chosen quotation. Go for the juicy ones, which will help you construct a nuanced argument. Then evaluate the statement in relation to this quotation. Phrases such as, to some extent, it could be argued that, and in some ways can be helpful. Don't spend too long on one text. Compare every three sentences using phrases such as, whereas text X suggests that, text Y seems to indicate that, and, in this respect, text X more powerfully suggests that a day by the sea is enjoyable due to. Before I introduce these trickier texts, here is the statement that I'd like you to ponder. Both texts powerfully create a tense and frightening atmosphere. How far do you agree with this statement? As you read the text, you might like to take screenshots and annotate quotations, which clearly indicate a tense and frightening atmosphere, but also, with a different colour, those which somehow seem less tense and frightening, more light-hearted perhaps. Time for the text. In this extract from Great Expectations, Pip comes across an escaped convict whilst visiting his parents' graves. Hold your noise, cried a terrible voice as a man started up from among the graves at the side of the church porch. Keep still, you little devil, and I cut your throat. A fearful man, all in coarse grey, with a great iron on his leg, a man with no hats and with broken shoes, and with an old rag tied round his head. A man who had been soaked in water and smothered in mud and lamed by stones and cut by flints and stung by nettles and torn by briars, who limped and shivered and glared and growled and whose teeth chattered in his head as he seized me by the chin. Oh, don't cut my throat, sir, I pleaded in terror. Pray don't do it, sir. Tell us your name, said the man. Quick! Pip, sir. Once more, said the man staring at me. Give it mouth. Pip! Pip, sir. Show us where you live, said the man. Pint out the place. I pointed to where our village lay on the flat inshore among the older trees and pollards, or a mile or more from the church. The man, after looking at me for a moment, turned me upside down and emptied my pockets. There was nothing in them but a piece of bread. When the church came to itself, for he was so sudden and strong that he made it go head over heels before me, and I saw the steeple under my feet, when the church came to itself, I say, I was seated on a high tombstone, trembling while he ate the bread ravenously. You young dog, said the man licking his lips, what fat cheeks you've got. I believe they were fat, though I was at that time undersized for my years and not strong. Darn me if I couldn't eat them, said the man with a threatening shake of his head, and if I haven't half a mind to it. I earnestly expressed my hope that he wouldn't and held tighter to the tombstone on which he had put me, partly to keep myself upon it, partly to keep myself from crying. Now look here, said the man. Where's your mother? There, sir, said I. He started, made a short run and stopped and looked over his shoulder. There, sir, I timidly explained. Also Georgiana, that's my mother. Oh, said he, coming back. And is that your father along or your mother? Yes, sir, said I. Him too, late to this parish. Text 2. Mr Enfield recounts a curious incident to his old friend, Mr Utterson. Mr Enfield and the lawyer were on the other side of the by-street. 
But when they came abreast of the entry, the former lifted up his cane and pointed. Did you ever remark that door? he asked, and when his companion had replied in the affirmative, it is connected in my mind, said he, with a very odd story. Indeed, said Mr. Utterson with a slight change of voice. And what was that? Well, it was this way, returned Mr. Enfield. I was coming home from some place at the end of the world, about three o'clock of a black winter morning, and my way lay through a part of town where there was literally nothing to be seen but lamps. Street after street and all the folks asleep. Street after street all lighted as up as if for a procession, and all as empty as a church. Till at last I got into that state of mind where a man listens and listens and begins to long for the sight of a policeman. All at once I saw two figures. One, a little man who was stumping along eastward at a good walk, and the other, a girl of maybe eight or ten, who was running as hard as she was able down a cross street. Well, sir, the two ran into one another naturally enough at the corner. And then came the horrible part of the thing, for the man trampled calmly over the child's body and left her screaming on the ground. It sounds nothing to hear, but it was hellish to see. It wasn't like a man, it was like some damn juggernaut. I gave a few halloas, took to my heels, collared my gentleman and brought him back to where there was already quite a group about the screaming child. He was perfectly cool and made no resistance, but gave me one look, so ugly that it brought out the sweat on me like running. The people who had turned up were the girl's own family, and pretty soon the doctor, for whom she had been sent, put in his appearance. Well, the child was not much the worse, more frightened, according to the sawbones, and there you might have supposed would be an end to it. But there was one curious circumstance. I had taken a loathing to my gentleman at first sight, so had the child's family, which was only natural. But the doctor's case was what struck me. He was the usual cut-and-dry apothecary, of no particular age and colour with a strong Edinburgh accent, and about as emotional as a bagpipe. Well, sir, he was like the rest of us. Every time he looked at my prisoner, I saw that sawburns turn white and sick with the desire to kill him. I knew what was in his mind, just as he knew what was in mine, and killing being out of the question, we did the next best. We told the man we could and would make such a scandal out of this as should make his name stink from one end of London to the other. If he had any friends or any credit, we undertook that he should lose them. And all the time, as we were pitching it, pitching it in red hot, we were keeping the women off him as best we could, for they were as wild as harpies. I never saw a circle of such hateful faces. And there was the man in the middle with a kind of black, sneering coolness. Frightened too, I could see that but carrying it off, sir, really like Satan. If you choose to make capital out of this accident, said he, I am naturally helpless. No gentleman, but wishes to avoid a scene, says he. Name your figure. Well, we screwed him up to a hundred pounds for the child's family. He would have clearly liked to stick out, but there was something about the lot of us that meant mischief, and at last he struck. The next thing was to get the money. And where do you think he carried us but to that place with the door? Whipped out a key, went in, and presently came back with a matter of ten pounds in gold and a cheque for the balance on Cootsis, drawn payable to bearer and signed with a name that I can't mention, though it's one of the points of my story, but it was a name at least very well known and often printed. The figure was stiff, but the signature was good for more than that if it was only genuine. I took the liberty of pointing out to my gentleman that the whole business looked apocryphal, and that a man does not in real life walk into a cellar door at four in the morning and come out with another man's cheque for close upon a hundred pounds. But he was quite easy and sneering. Set your mind at rest, says he. I will stay with you till the bank's open and cash the cheque myself. So we all set off, the doctor and the child's father and our friend and myself, and passed the rest of the night in my chambers. And next day, when we had breakfasted, went in a body to the bank. I gave him the cheque myself and said I had every reason to believe it was a forgery. Not a bit of it. The cheque was genuine. So, how far do you agree with the idea that both texts powerfully create a tense and frightening atmosphere? Two choices for you. Either launch immediately into briefly annotating your extracts and producing your response, remembering that you are looking to produce around 600 words in around 30 minutes, 
or scrutinize the hints that are about to appear on screen, which may help you produce even more nuanced, intelligent evaluation. Look away from the screen now and wait for my voice if you don't want to see these. Time to get started. The text will reappear at five second intervals. Off you go. Good luck. How did you get on? Time to compare your response to my model full marks answer. Text one describes an encounter between a desperate convict and a young child. Whilst text two focuses on an exchange between two adults, in which one of them recounts a time in which he saw a man trample on a young girl. One might expect text one to have a more tense and frightening atmosphere due to the fact that the narrator is the young child, albeit writing as an adult. However, the reverse is the case. Certainly, the opening to text 1 is more tense and dramatic. The convict's opening words are threatening and, from a child's perspective, frightening. Hold your noise. Keep still, you little devil, or I'll cut your throat. There are no phatic greetings, merely abrupt imperatives and the immediate threat to kill the narrator in a terrifying bloody way builds up tension, particularly as the speaker is not initially seen. In contrast, text 2 is a much slower build-up with a preamble in which Mr Enfield sets the scene and describes a setting in which all the folks are asleep. Although in some ways this could be seen as less powerful, it is worth emphasising that Enfield feels unsettled by this black winter morning and ends up in a state of mind where a man listens and longs for the sight of a policeman. This adds tension in a different, subtler way. The reader may be interested in why Enfield is walking home at three o'clock of a black winter morning and feel the potential of this setting for unsettling odd and evil acts. Whereas tension increases slowly through text 2, text 1 gradually becomes less tense and more comic. For instance, the writer makes reference to Pip being mugged. The convict turned him upside down and emptied his pockets. We might expect such an event to be recounted in a way which emphasises violence and violation but instead we are given a quasi-comic description of Pip's perspective after being picked up. The church came to itself. He made it go head over heels before me. This is a fun, hyperbolic description of Pip's feelings of disorientation, which results in a less tense and frightening atmosphere, particularly as it is being narrated by Pip as an adult. We can safely presume that no long-lasting harm comes to him as a result of this encounter. In contrast, text 2's description of the man's trampling is deeply disturbing. He trampled calmly over the child's body like some damn juggernauts. The oxymoronic trampled calmly combines mindless violence from an adult towards an innocent child with tranquility, which suggests that the former could well be a dangerous psychopath. Indeed, Mr Enfield draws attention to the inhumanness of the man and act. It wasn't like a man which contrasts once again with the convict in Teps 1, who may threaten, but is all too human in his need for warmth and shelter, who limped and shivered. The lack of genuine threat from the convict is emphasised towards the end of Text 1, when he nearly runs away. Following Pip's revelation that his mother is there, sir, he started, made a short run and stopped and looked over his shoulder. These are not the actions of a fundamentally dangerous psychopath, but someone who is on edge and nervous and desperate to avoid adult human society, even a woman. 
In contrast, the strange aloofness of the trampler in text 2 continued to unsettle the reader. In spite of being surrounded by furious women, he retains a black, sneering coolness like Satan and manages to obtain a cheque for a huge sum of money from a different man to compensate the girl's family. The fact that such an apparent psychopath is linked to reputable society and has access to so much money increases tension whilst the simile confirms that such an individual may be purely evil, with no redeeming features whatsoever. How does this response achieve full marks? Well, note that in the summary I immediately show that I've got what the two passages are about, and that I make an interesting point in relation to the statements. One might expect text 1 to have a more tense and frightening atmosphere due to the fact that the narrator is the young child, albeit writing as an adult. However, the reverse is the case. So this is more interesting and engaging than the simple and obvious both texts create a tense and frightening atmosphere. Note the concision of my evaluation post-quotation and how quickly I move on to the second text. Note here the more sophisticated nuanced evaluation. I point out that the absence of action and threats might make us think that text 2 is less frightening and tense before suggesting that the reverse is the case. It is just that it is subtler than the melodrama in text 1. Scrutinise this topic sentence not unnecessarily long and a more skillful comparison than simply leading with a connective and making a point about just one of the texts. I would certainly recommend using one whereas structure in every question four you complete. Always look for opportunities to compare and contrast. Look at how I do this at the end of my penultimate paragraph and bring in a short bracketed satellite quotation to back up the convict's lack of genuine threat. Aim to make your evaluation as precise and insightful as possible. This doesn't necessarily need to result in multiple sentences, as you can see here as I point out that the convict running away goes against the idea that he is a dangerous cannibal but instead points to him being someone more to be pitied rather than anything else. This has been a Schofield on Shakespeare production, giving you help with a trickier question for...